to give you an opportunity to be blessed and not cursed. Above and not beneath. Riding and not walking. The Lord says this. He says, give. Everybody say, give. That's a four-letter word you're allowed to use. Amen. Give. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a commandment of God. He said, give. Give. It's something he told us to do. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He said, shall men give it to your brother? He's not going to produce money in heaven and rain it down. No, it's not what he's going to do. And, and blessings and sometimes wealth does not come in the form of money. It may come in the form of family, amen, and good health. Or a spouse or a friend, amen. But God says, give, and it's going to be given unto you good measure, pressed down, shaving in and running over, shall men give it to your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet, with all will be measured to you again. In other words, how you plant is how you reap a harvest. How you give is how you receive. How you sow is how you reap, amen. So this morning as the ushers come and we prepare to receive this morning's tithes and offering, I want to encourage you to sow a generous seed. You can never outgive God because whatever you give is going to come back. You're going to see your offering again. I used to wonder why Gideon, uh, you know, Gideon was outnumbered like a thousand to one. He was going into a battle that looked unwinnable. But God encouraged him by giving him a dream. And the dream was a loaf of bread that the enemy had. A, they had a dream of a loaf of bread attacked their tent. And I thought, what is that? Are you kidding me? If I'm going into battle and I'm outnumbered a thousand to one and they've got weapons and swords and arrows and spears, I don't want to dream about a loaf of bread or potato chips. Hello. But, but it meant something to Gideon and not to me because I, I wasn't there. See, the Lord met with Gideon before the battle. And Gideon said, don't leave until I give you an offering. And if you remember, Gideon was a wheat farmer. He grew wheat. He made bread for a living. And he gave of his living. He gave of his livelihood to the Lord. He gave an offering. And part of that offering was bread. And what Gideon saw in that dream was his offering in the hands of God became a weapon against his adversary. Amen. See, Gideon saw his offering again. Friends, when you give, I want to promise you something. You will see your offering again. I know you will because God gave us his word. Give and it shall be given unto you. It will come back to you. But it's not going to come back the same way you gave it. It's going to come back pressed down, shaken together and running over. So let's pray with the offering this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to sow a seed into the kingdom of heaven. Bless this offering. Multiply it. Let it meet all the needs of the church. Let it be enough and to spare and Lord, multiply the gift back to the giver many times over. Let it answer every prayer, heal every hurt, supply every need. In Jesus' holy name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. Now, if you're giving with a check, just write a check out to CLC. If you're giving with your check card or your debit card, make sure you fill out all the information on the envelope, including your expiration date and your phone number. Or you can give uh, simply by dialing 940-241-4450. It's a program called Tide Lead, 940-241-4450. You can just text any amount to that number, and we'll receive it. Of course, you can. those that are watching, you can mail an offering in, or you can go to our website, tlc-church.com. There's a menu bar that says Give on top. Click that, and the menu will come down. And ushers, whenever you're ready, you can receive this morning's tithes and offering. I'm going to share a message with you this morning that I've entitled, What Time Is It? What Time Is It? I'll be reading from the book of Acts, chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. Then I'm going to go to chapter 2. What time is it? Acts chapter 1 verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, the number of names together were about 120. Now, I just want you to notice that. It, it specifies that there was a 120. Somebody say 120. There was 120 in the upper room when the Holy Spirit was going to come. And Acts chapter 2 verse 1. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What time is it? That's a question I get asked a lot today. Pastor, what time is it? Is the Lord coming soon? When is Jesus coming? Uh, a few weeks back, actually it's probably been a couple of months ago, I had a young lady call me and she was frantic. Pastor Rodriguez, I need to talk to you. Do you have time to talk? Please, I need to I said, sure. I was busy. I'm always busy. But, but boy, she was frantic and she was nervous. I could tell. And I, I said, well, how can I help you? She said, is Jesus coming soon? I've heard that he's about to come. Is he, when is he coming? And I told her, I said, Thursday. She went, what? I said, I'm just kidding. I said, no. I said, I mean, good. I said, but I said, in all honesty, I don't think he's going to come that quick. I said, I believe he is soon. Is very, his, his return is very soon. 
But I think there's a couple more things that are about to happen. But I said, things are getting close. She said, what do you mean? How close? I said, well, I think it's going to be a few years yet. But everything's lined up. You know, the Bible talks about the last days, a cashless society. Do you know that stores right now are saying, we don't take cash? It's dirty. We don't want to get COVID. We don't want cash. We're, we're, we're going into that cashless society. We're going into a one world government. The Bible said in the last days, knowledge will increase. Today, when a child graduates college, what he learned the first year is, is obsolete his fourth year. That's how rapidly knowledge is advancing. It said travel would uh, increase. Travel has in increased so much that people now can sign up to take a trip to outer space just for fun, if you have the money. That's how much travel has increased. We we're sending ships to the moon and to Mars and to different places in, in outer space. It said in the last days it would be tumultuous times. Boy, are there. Somebody said the most useless thing that you could buy is a 2020 uh, scheduler, you know, planner calendar. <laughs> How can you plan anything? Everything changes. Amen. We're living in the last days, but this young lady was so frantic. I told her, look, I, I said, the Lord's not coming this week. I said, he's, I, I, I don't really feel it is. Uh, he is. I said, he's coming soon, and, and things are wrapping up. You need to get your heart right with God. I said, I believe in, in not many years he'll be here. I said, I believe in your lifetime he could come. I said, did you hear what I said? There was no answer. I said, are you there? No answer. I said, hello? She had called me on Messenger. And so I went to her Facebook page. And I saw that she had, within the last five seconds, just put a new post. Who wants to go party tonight? I thought, man, I should have just left with the answer Thursday. <laughs> you know, man. When I told her, no, I don't think he's coming this week. She took a text her, hey, let's go party. He ain't coming this week. Well, he could. The point is, we don't know when he's coming. We don't know the day or the hour. But you don't know if you're going to make it to next week. Hello? Nobody has tomorrow guaranteed. The day you were born, you were in line. In a line that leads to death. The day you were born, you got in line. And don't think that just when you were born that you got put at the end of the line. Because I've done a lot of funerals for little children. Some that were months old. Some that were days old. Some that were a few years old. When they were born, they probably didn't realize that they were way up in the front of the line. But we're all headed to that line. Hello? None of us have tomorrow guaranteed. We don't, you know, if Jesus takes another hundred years to come, what does that mean to us? We're going to meet him sooner than that. Hello? We need to be ready. Turn to someone and say, get ready. Amen? What time is it? What time is it on God's calendar? It's interesting to see some of these things that are happening. You know, Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in diverse places, signs in the heavens above and in the earth beneath. And we've seen all of these things come to pass. I'll tell you one of the greatest signs that ever happened, happened in 1948, when after 2,000 years, Israel became a nation again. And that's been over 50 years ago now. Almost over 70 years ago. I will tell you, that was a huge sign. There was a huge sign in the heavens a few years back. I will tell you something. I believe Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Jesus is coming soon. The question really isn't, when is He coming? The question is, are you ready when He comes? Amen? Are you ready when He comes? The Lord can come any time. But the main point is, none of us have tomorrow guaranteed, and we need to be ready should He come today. Amen? I want to talk to you about the time in which we live. To help you see where we are on God's calendar. In the first verses we just read, it was interesting because in Acts chapter 1, the, the author made a special note to say that there was 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Why is that important? Well, in the Bible, the number 120 is significant. It, it represents the end of the flesh and the beginning of the Spirit. And here the Holy Spirit is about to be poured out. And it says there was 120 on the day of Pentecost. Penta means 5 or 50. And it was the 50th day. That's when the celebration of Pentecost took place. That's why it was called Pentecost. It meant 50. And so it's 120 on the 50th day. 120 times 50 is 6,000 years. See, most scholars believe that God gave man six millennium on the earth. That's why he created man on the sixth day. And on the seventh day, he rested. Because man was going to have 6,000 years before the Lord would turn. And he said, you'll have a millennial reign with him. That's why a lot of people thought the Lord would come in the year 2000 because that would make sense. 
you know, he came after 4,000 years, and then 2,000 years later would be the end of the sixth day, the beginning of the seventh. The only problem with that is that I don't believe that it counted when he came. I believe it counted when he said it's finished on the cross. When he died, he said it's finished. That was around the year two, uh, 33 and a half A.D. And so that, that would mean that around the year 2033 and a half, that would be the end of the second uh, day after his coming. In the beginning of the third day, Jesus rode on the, rose on the early morning hours of the third day. So we're, we're getting close to those times. And I believe Jesus is coming soon. Where are we on that timetable? Every word in the Bible is significant. None of it is there just to fill space. Every word is significant. We see that while the Apostle Peter is telling us about the events, he takes time to mention there was 120 in the upper room because it represents the end of the flesh, the beginning of the Spirit. And that's what happened. Jesus in the flesh left and, the, and, and now His Holy Spirit came to dwell in us. He was with us, but now He's going to be in us. Amen. We see the picture of the rapture of the church with the number 120 in Genesis Chapter 6, verse 3, it says, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he is also flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Man's time on the earth will be 120, and, and the Hebrew word is eons. It means a specific time. Not just a year, but a, a, a particular type of year. Most scholars believe it's a jubilee year, which is every 50 years. 120 times 50 is 6,000. So God says, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that his days shall be 120 eons, or 120 years. Most people believe that that's that 6,000 year plan of God. After 6,000 years, man's time on the earth, as we know, will be complete. And the, and the church will be taken up, will be raptured. We see this picture throughout the Bible. We see it in the creation story, when God created everything in six days, and on the seventh day He rested. We see it in the life of Moses in, in Exodus 24, verse 16. It says, And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. Notice, Moses is waiting on God. And there's a cloud there for six days, but on the seventh day, God calls Moses into the cloud. It said, A cloud covered it six days, and on the seventh day, He called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. He calls Moses in. And Moses comes in and, and sees God face to face on the seventh day. And we're living in the early morning hours of the seventh day. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. I believe that uh, He could come any day. I believe the trumpet is getting ready to, to sound. Amen. Man's time on this planet, as we know it, is six millennium, followed by a sound of a trumpet, a shout, and then Jesus, the lion of the tribe of Judah, will return. He's always reigned, but he came first as a lamb, and we'll see him later as the lion. Look what the Bible says about Moses. When Moses died at the age of 120, it says in Deuteronomy 34, And he buried him in the valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knows of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor was his natural force abated. Notice it says he, he wasn't losing his vision. He wasn't losing his strength. In other words, Moses was healthy. Moses was strong. The reason the Lord took him at the age of 120 is because it was a prophetic picture. That's the only reason. In Jude chapter 1 verse 9 it says, Yet Michael, the archangel, would, would, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. He did not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuked thee. Now see, the devil wanted to try to find out where Moses was buried so he could have the people worship the sepulcher. And so he was arguing with Michael the archangel, but, but he never found out where the sepulcher was. We're en route to our promised land, just like Moses was taking the, the Hebrew children to the promised land. When Moses was 120, he went to be with the Lord. After 120 jubilees, we won't be found either because the church will be raptured. If you look at the battle of Jericho, you see Yeshua, Joshua, Yeshua, which means Jesus or Savior. He sends two spies into Jericho before bringing judgment. Jesus gave us his word in two forms, the written word and the prophetic spoken word, the Old Testament and the New Testament. You see Joshua, the general, and he sends the two spies into Jericho. You see Jesus, uh, the the. Full manifestation of God in the body form. And he sends his written word and he sends his prophetic spoken word 
to warn mankind that he's coming, the living word. Amen. If you remember, Rahab talked to the spies and said, look, I've been good to you. Would you be good to me and spare our lives? They said, we'll spare your life. But you've got to hang that red cord out the window. You've got to be covered in that red cord, which is a picture of the blood of Jesus. They were saying, we're going to come in and we're going to bring judgment upon this city. And anyone who's out in the street, their life's in their own hands. If they're not right with God, you know, we're going to kill them. But if you're under the blood, we'll spare your life. If you're under that red cord, we'll spare your life. I often wondered about Rahab, and I, I thought, man, what if she would have told everyone in the city, look, you've got to hang a red cord out your window, because they won't touch your house. Yeshua is a man of his word. The Bible says Jesus puts his word above his own name. Joshua would keep his word. He said, when I see that red cord, I won't touch it. Can you imagine that the walls of Jericho would have fallen and Joshua and his army comes rushing in and they look at every house, every business, every building has a red cord outside the window. I imagine Joshua would have looked around and said, well, would you look at this? Put your swords away, boys. They're covered in the blood. We shouldn't walk through this town and leave it alone. Joshua was a man of his word. I believe no one had to lose their life in Jericho. And you know there was good people in Jericho. I'm sure there were. I mean, there had to be teachers and daycare workers and cooks and bankers and bakers and beggars and ball players. I mean, you know, it was a city. It was a big city. Just like our city, there's all kinds of people. I'm sure they weren't all soldiers and warriors and they weren't all evil. There was probably some nice people. And I've had people tell me that, Pastor, my, my dad's a nice guy. I said, well, that's great. I'm glad he is. He's being a mean guy, you know, but... Being nice isn't what gets us to heaven. Being good isn't what gets us to heaven. One man said, I, I'm, I'm a good guy. I'm a nice guy. And if your God won't let me into heaven because I'm, uh, because I'm not uh, a Christian, I'm not born again, then he must be a, a terrorist. He must be an evil God because I'm a nice guy. And he was asked, what if somebody knocked on your house at midnight? You know, where you and your wife and your children live. And they said, we want to come in and stay in your house. And you say, well, who are you? They say, well, that's not important. I know you don't know us, but, but I'm a nice guy. You won't let him in? You don't know him? He's not a relative? You've never met him? He said, but he says he's a nice guy. You're going to let him come in and live with you and stay with your children and your wife and you, your family? I don't think so. Neither is God. God says, depart from me. I never knew you. If you want to get into heaven, there's a way. And Jesus said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you want to get into heaven, you have to receive Jesus as Lord. He died for you. The Son of God became a man so that men could become the sons of God. He died that we might live. And all you got to do is accept the price that he paid. And that red cord covers your life. Amen. And when judgment comes and they see the blood, they'll pass over you. Amen. What a beautiful picture in the battle of Jericho. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. Amen? Jesus is coming soon. There was 120 in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. And they were in one accord. They were in unity. In 2 Chronicles 5.11 it says, And it came to pass when the priests were come out of the holy place, for all the priests that were present were sanctified and did not then wait by course. Also the Levites, which were the singers, all of them, Asaph and Heman of Jeduthun, with their sons and their brethren, being arrayed in white linen, having cymbals and psalters and harps, stood at the east of the altar, and with them 120 priests sounding with trumpets. Notice, we said number 120 again, it represents the end of the flesh, the beginning of the spirit. 120 priests praising God in one accord. It says, as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound when they were in one accord, when they were in unity, to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. When they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music, and they praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever, that the house was filled with the cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. When there was 120 together, in one accord, worshiping God, it says they couldn't even stand up because the Holy Ghost showed up. Amen. 120 
end of the flesh, beginning of the spirit. The end of the flesh, the beginning of the spirit. This took place when, when King Solomon built his temple. Look at the 120 priests that were, were, were praising God. It says their names were Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun. Asaph means gathering. Heman means faithful. And Jeduthun means praising. When the gathering of the faithful began to praise, the Holy Ghost fell. Amen. And the glory of the Lord filled the temple. And they couldn't stand this is a picture of the rapture of the church, the return of the Lord after 6,000 years. On the seventh day, Yeshua entered into the promised land. We're living in the early morning hours of the seventh millennium. We're about to hear the sound of a trumpet. I think it's interesting that our president's name is Trump. I believe that's a sign of the times. I really do. I want you to see another attribute about these this 120 worshipers, Asaph, Heman, and Jeduthun. In, in uh, 1 Chronicles 25, verse 1, it says, Moreover, David and the captains of the host separated to the service, service of the sons of Asaph and Heman and Jeduthun, who should prophesy with harps and with psalters and with cymbals. And the number of the workmen according to their service. In the last days, we not only see a generation of prophets, but it says that they're going to prophesy with their instruments. Not just prophesy with their voices, not just prophesy with their words, but they're going to be in one accord. They're going to prophesy with their music. There's going to be an Elijah type of prophetic anointing. Like the anointing that was on John the Baptist. He was called the voice of one crying in the wilderness. The 120 trumpeters made a sound of, as of one in the temple. The 120 in the upper room were all in one accord when the Spirit descended. And I believe a prophetic church of the last days will once again make a sound as of one. A sound of the Holy Spirit ushering in the return of Jesus. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. The signs are all around us. Man was created on the sixth day. You know, you hear about the mark of the beast, 666. Well, that just talks about the end of time for man, 666. It's, it's three. Uh, three represents fullness. The fullness of God is Father, Son, Spirit. The fullness of the Word is the written, the living, and the spoken. The, the fullness of time is past, present, and future. The fullness of creation is time, space, and matter. The fullness of matter is a solid, liquid, or gas. The, the fullness of, the, the, the fullness of uh, time, past, present, and future. The, the, the fullness of space, length, width, and depth. I mean, it's a trinity. God is three in one. And when you see the three sixes, he's saying it's the end of time for man. It says there's going to be a mark of the beast. You won't be able to buy or sell without it because you're not going to use money anymore. And we're at that day that now you can go to stores today. This was never thought possible when I was a youngster. But you go to stores today and it says we do not accept cash. We don't, we don't want your money. We don't want to touch your money. I told you a while back I went to McDonald's and uh, went to the drive through window and the guy told me the price. I gave him some money. He took the money and he gave me a receipt. I said, I, said, I don't want the receipt. I want to hand it back to him. He said, oh, I can't take it from you. And I thought, well, you took my money. <laughs> you know, why can't you take your receipt? But I don't want to argue with him. You know, he's a young boy doing his job. But that's how it is. They're going to say, I don't want your money anymore. It's, it's tainted. It could be dirty. How are you going to pay for things? With your smartphone just at the window? Beep. Beep. And the Bible prophesied this thousands of years ago. That in the last days you wouldn't be able to buy or sell without a, without a number. We're living in that day. Amen. We're living in a time when the church of the Lord Jesus Christ will finally be united for one purpose, to lift up the name of Jesus and to prepare the bride to receive her groom. Look at one of the signs of the times that Jesus gives us in the book of 2 Timothy. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. Wow. Perilous times. If there was ever a phrase that would describe the year in which we leave, live, perilous times would be it. Amen? Perilous times. It says men will be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful. Unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers. You mean they won't tell the truth? Remember when you used to watch the news to see what was happening and now you 
You wonder why you're watching it all? Because you hear what they're saying and you don't know what to believe, what not to believe. Because there's so much falsehoods taking place. Amen? False accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive, lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lust. Man, friends, we're living in the last days. Look at another interesting thing that takes place after the temple is complete. Remember, when the church age is complete, the Lord is going to rapture the saints. And there will be a seven-year tribulation period. And the Antichrist and the false prophet and the beast will rule for the last three and a half years. And society will have to wear the mark of the beast. This all happens as a completion of this 6,000 year period. At the end of the sixth day and the beginning of the seventh. In 2 Chronicles chapter 9 it talks about it. It talks about the queen of Sheba. It's interesting because the name Sheba means seven. See, we're the bride of Christ. We're the queen that's going to be taken on the seventh day. The queen of Sheba, the queen of the seventh day, heard of the fame of Solomon, which means peace. She came to prove Solomon with hard questions at Jerusalem, with a very great company and camels that bear spices and gold in abundance and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she com uh, communed with him of, of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. And there was nothing hid from Solomon which he had not, uh, told her not. And when the queen of Sheba had seen the wisdom of Solomon and the house that he had built and the meat of his table and the sitting of the servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel, his cupbearers also in their apparel and his ascent by which he went up into the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her, the queen of the seventh day. Her spirit left. The rapture of the church. Picture here. We're still here, but it says there's no, the world is still here, but there's no more spirit. In other words, the Christians will be taken. The 120 jubilee years were complete. We should see the number 666. It says in 2 Chronicles 9, 9, And she gave the king 120 talents of gold. Well, there's that number again. 120. 120 talents of gold. Why does it say 120 talents of gold? What's the golden anniversary? Anybody know? It's 50 years. 120 talents of gold. The gold represents the 50 again. 120 times 50, 6,000. She gave the king 120 talents of gold, a spice in great abundance, and precious stones. Neither was there any such spice as the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. And then in 2 Chronicles 9, verse 13, look what it says about Solomon. It says, Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year. How much gold came to him in that year? We're reading about the queen of the seventh day, the rapture of the church, the spirit leaving. It's God's timetable. You should see the number 666. Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 600. Three score, a score is 20, that's 300, 660 and six talents of gold. There you see the number again. We're living in the last days. Friends, Jesus is coming soon. Now I can't give you the day or the hour. The Bible says no man knows, not even the Son of God knows the day or the hour. But we know the season. And friends, we're, we're smack dab in the middle of it. Amen. Jesus is coming soon. The signs of the times, the signs of His return are all around us. And I could go on for hours and hours giving you more and more biblical evidence and prophetic proof that we're living in the last moments of the history of mankind. Even the world can sense the signs of the time. The movies that came out in recent years are movies like Armageddon, Asteroid, Apocalypse, The Day After. One movie was called The Missing because they're preparing for that. They realize that one day people are just going to show up missing. They're not going to be around. And this movie didn't have anything to do with prophecy, but just the fact that people would be sucked up into heaven. <laughs> Even the world is getting ready because Jesus is coming soon and they know it. Let's stand together. I hope the message you know, ministered to you. Listen, I want to encourage you to invite Jesus to be Lord of your life. If you haven't done that already, do that now. All you got to do is say, Jesus, come into my life. Be Lord of my life. Forgive me of all my sins. Wash them away with your blood. I accept you as my Savior and Lord. And I make a vow to serve you, Jesus, as Lord of my life for the rest of my life. If you prayed that prayer with me, if you believe it in your heart, you confess with your mouth, 
you're saved. Amen. And I want to ask you if you would consider sowing uh, financial seed into the ministry. That it's simple to do. All you got to do is text any amount to the number on your screen, 940-241-4450. That number again is 940-241-4450. You can text any amount to that number. Or if you'd like, you can go on our website, uh, clc-church.com. That's clc-church.com. And on the menu bar, the word, you'll see the word give. Click on the button that says give. A menu will drop down, and you can give through PayPal that way. Or if you'd like to mail an offering in, you can do that. Our mailing address is 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. And the zip is 77339. That's 806 Russell Palmer Road, Kingwood, Texas. Zip is 77339. Of course, my favorite way for you to give is to come into the church and fellowship with us. We just want to get to meet you and love you and uh, pray with you. And we hope to see you here soon. Come out and visit us, Christian Life Center here in Kingwood, Texas. Once again, thanks for watching. God bless you.